Well, good morning. Let me say what a great privilege it is to be able to lead and to join you in our worship of God this morning. My name is Samuel Scott. I'm a first year ministry student at Union Theological College. And can I at this point just take opportunity uh, to congratulate you all in the church for recently calling your new minister. And I trust that there will be fruitful days ahead for you as a congregation as you seek to serve the Lord together. Sometimes when we come for worship together, the main thing in our mind is how long is it going to be until we get out again? You know, how long is this guy at the front going to talk and keep us until we're able to get out and get on with the rest of our lives? But we meet this morning uh, to worship a God who can sustain us, feed us and strengthen us for our lives. So let's not let this time of worship go by where we might be daydreaming or distracted. But let's make the effort to focus our hearts on God this morning in worship and drink deep of the waters of life that we might be satisfied as we then go on to live out our Christian lives of faith together. Our call to worship is Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Let us thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works for the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Amen. And may God satisfy our souls this morning as we praise him for his steadfast love.
us pray. Father, to you be honour, glory and praise. You stretched out the heavens, the earth and the oceans. The cattle on a thousand hills are thine, and you made us in your own image. Thank you that we can now meet in your house on your day to worship you with our church family. Above all, thank you for the cross, where the fairest of 10,000 laid down his life for us. Be with those who cannot be here today because of frailty or sickness. May they know your presence in a very real way. Comfort those who have been bereaved during this pandemic and have to cope with all the restrictions. Strengthen them, Lord, for the going on. Strengthen our doctors and nurses as they fight this pandemic and help them, Father, to get rest. Forgive us for turning away from the living bread to the things of this world. Christ, no longer all in all, our witness weak. Father, forgive. Help us to find our nourishment in Christ, who alone can meet our deepest need, who alone can strengthen us to be more and more like Jesus, to stand in the hour of trial. Everything around us seems to be giving way, but you are our rock and our redeemer. Help us to stand on the solid ground of Christ. Thank you for the wonderful truth that you do not give way. Christ is ours for all eternity and will never be taken from us. Father, pour out your spirit in this place as we go through this time of change. We ask for your enabling for our new minister, Reverend Craig Lynn and his family. Help them with all the adjustments they will have to make. Use them mightily for your kingdom. We pray that Christ will be lifted up in this place. Your word be honoured and treasured. Rise us from apathy. Renew our zeal for the gospel. Enable us to keep walking in Christ day by day until you call us home. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, really built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. But the fruit the Holy Spirit produces is love, joy and peace. It is being patient, kind and good. It is being faithful and gentle and having control of oneself. There is no law against things of that kind. Good morning, boys and girls. This morning, I'm going to show you something that you see at Christmas time. No, not the decorations, the pretty wrapped presents, nor even the man himself, Father Christmas. No, I'm going to show you something that grows in the ground, that we have on our dinner table at Christmas, and they're green. Yes, you've guessed it, Brussels sprouts. Now, we grow those on our farm as they don't grow like you see them on your plate, but on a sprout stalk, which looks like this. Okay, so what do we do to grow a sprout stalk, especially one with plenty of healthy, good sized sprouts on it? Well, it all starts with a tiny seed. 
out of her packet, sown way back in the springtime. And by June, we have a tiny plant about so big. And at that stage, we plant them in good soil that has been carefully prepared with all the nutrients to help it grow slowly and steadily until the sprouts are this size, just before Christmas, ready for pulling, selling and eating. These sprout plants also need light, warmth and moisture. Ideally, lots of rain showers to help them grow properly. And as I'm sure you know, they also need roots to grow. They too are very important, although they're hidden underground. We talk about the fruit of the spirit, boys and girls. This grows within us if we believe and belong to Christ Jesus. So when we accept Jesus as our Saviour and Lord, he plants the seed of his Holy Spirit within us. And at first we'll hardly know it's there. But just like the tiny sprout seed, it contains everything within it to produce good fruit. Not sprouts nor any other type of fruit or veg, of course, but love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So we don't enjoy this fruit right away. We have to look after it the way we look after our sprouts here. It has to be planted in good soil. And if we submit to God's will, that's very good soil. Then we need to nurture the seed of the Holy Spirit through his word. By that, we mean read our Bibles to really get to know what God wants us to do. This sprout stalk doesn't grow alone. It grows in what we call a flat, or perhaps you would call it a patch, where there are lots of other sprouts growing alongside it. We also grow steadily if we're surrounded and supported by our church family. We learn from our church family members how to walk in God's ways, and they also help us not to sin by their loving support. Vegetables need roots to grow too. We can't see them under the ground, but they're very important. If you look here at the sprout, you see the big root system on it. Also, if we are rooted in faith in Jesus, then we will produce fruit, the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. We can only display these fruits with God's help if we're rooted in Jesus. Why is it important to grow in the spirit? Well, if we grow upright and strong in our faith, we show others that we are living for Jesus. Basically, we're showing on the outside what we feel in the inside. Just like the sprout stalk, we have to be patient. A sprout takes six months from a tiny plant to what I showed you here. So don't be discouraged if you feel that you're not growing or showing the fruits of the spirit right away. Just keep living each day for Jesus and he'll guide your way. Bye. Shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me. Shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me.
As we come to hear from God's word together, let's just take a moment to pray. Uh, pray that we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. So let's pray. Our Lord and our God, blessed are those who keep your testimonies, who seek you with their hearts and walk in your ways. So may our hearts be drawn to your son Jesus this morning, that we would faithfully walk with you as our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So hands up if you've seen the new Bond movie yet. And hands up maybe if you're still planning on going to see it. Uh, I don't normally advise people to cover their ears whenever I'm preaching. Not normally. Um, but I am going to spoil the Bond movie for you. So if you're planning on going to see it, you might want to cover your ears for the next minute or two. To be fair though, the movie has been out for a few weeks, so I think at this point it is fair game for spoilers. So in this new Bond, there's a big reveal about halfway through the movie, and it's this. Bond has a baby. Now this probably shouldn't surpri surprise us, judging by the way he carries on. He probably has a few dotted about the globe. But in this movie, Bond has a baby, and he actually meets this Wayne whenever She's a toddler. So you can imagine the shocked reactions of the movie going audience uh, as this child comes down the stairs and Daniel Craig Bond sees her for the first time. And there are so many questions going through our heads, aren't there? You know, Bond has a baby. How did this happen? How will he protect this precious child from all those bad men with the guns? But here's what I'm thinking whenever I see that baby come down the stairs. And maybe some of you can empathise with this this morning too. How is he ever going to fit a child's car seat into the back of that Aston Martin? Does that Aston Martin even have ISOFIX in the back seat? Unfortunately, uh, what is slick and what is cool and exciting is not always the most pragmatic. Uh, what is useful and sensible is often not that exciting. We had to replace our car recently, you see, and this is what brought it to mind when I was watching Bond. Because you go on used car NI and you look at all the specs and you want something, you know, got to get a fair bit of brake horsepower and all that. But really, if like me, you have children who need to have those big car seats and all that crack, then there is only one question you're asking when you go to look at a car and it's, well, is the boot big enough for a buggy? I mean, that's it, man. That is the only qualifier you have to worry about when it comes to shopping for cars with children. If only there was a car that was exciting as it was sensible. If only there was not just a Bond car, but a Bond and baby car to choose from too. Now, as Christians, we can feel like we're always having to pass up the exciting stuff in favour of the stuff that is safe. We follow Jesus and we have to say no to all the stuff that looks like it would be quite good fun. And we do often think this way. If you host a Q&A with maybe Christian young people, but I think we all ask these kinds of questions, it won't be long until somebody asks the question, well, do I have to do this? Or how often do I have to do that? 
can I still be a Christian and yet do this? Questions like that. And you can see what's being inferred there. You know, yes, I want the safe often option. Yes, I want to be a Christian. Uh, but do I have to do the boring stuff? Do I have to do the Bible reading every day? You know, I mean, who even reads anymore? Can I still be a Christian and do the fun things that my Christian or non-Christian friends do? Can I still be a Christian and spend most of my time and my money on myself rather than my church? So Christianity, as we often feel it in our hearts, is something that is safe, but just boring too. We think of following Jesus in the same way we think of a plain old brown bread chicken sandwich. Yes, it's healthy, but it's dry. Now this sound but boring problem, this seeking something more exciting, this is a problem that the Colossian Christians have when Paul writes his letter to them too. You see, we're told in these verses, in verse 6, that they once received Christ. They once considered him something new and something exciting to try. Uh, but at this point in their faith, the novelty factor has worn off. And Jesus has become just that little bit more mundane to them. And they're starting to drift away from him. But Paul says to them, if you want a life that has purpose, if you want some substance in your life, something that really means something, then you need to walk with Jesus in verse 6. You need to stop drifting and to get back to him. And if you want something that feels a little less mundane, then what you need is to learn to walk with gratitude, with abundant gratitude, as he says in verse 7. You know, he says, you're Christians you have received Christ and so your walk with him should be one that is close to him as your Lord and grateful to even be there. Never mind being tempted to drift away. It's a bit like if your child refuses to eat the sausage and chip meal that you've got them for dinner when you went to the chippy on the way home from work and they really defiantly throw the sausage to the dog and they refuse to eat the chips and you're thinking to yourself, do you know? Do you know how lucky you are to be getting a chippy tea? Back in my day, whenever I was your age, we never got a chippy tea. At least not on a work day night anyway. But here you are, you're wasting it and you're turning your nose up at something that you should be grateful to have. And Paul says to the Colossians and he says to us, well actually here's you. You're turning your nose up at Jesus when you should be grateful to have him. As your Lord and your Saviour. The reality is though that we do feel this sense of something lacking in our hearts and in our Christian lives. We sense a lack of vitality and well a lack of what we might call good juicy fruit that we heard from Galatians should really be there. And often on our more godly days we might feel like, well, we really want to force this sense of gratitude. We want to force more love for God in our hearts. Um, but it's not long before life dials up the pressure again. And life and sin is so quick to have those thorns grow around our hearts. And they squeeze tight as the pressure dials up, don't they? And they make us hurt. They make us bitter towards God rather than being grateful, as Paul says we should be. This lack of gratitude in life though, this is hardly just a problem for Christians. Uh, our world as a whole has a problem with being grateful. Just look at the waste around us. Look at how often we feel we have to upgrade our phones. Look at how entitled our culture is becoming. We're constantly discontent with what we have and the TV constantly tells us that we should be wanting more. There is and there always has been since the fall that hole in the human heart and we so badly want to fill it but no matter what we do nothing ever plugs that aching gap. So no one, no matter if you're religious or not, no one can find that grateful satisfied life. We are discontent, we are disenchanted, we are dissatisfied. 
And why is that? Well, the Bible tells us that it's because we've set our roots in the wrong place. We can't get no satisfaction, as the song says, because we're trying to suck up nutrients that just aren't there to be had. We might seek purpose or seek excitement in romantic relationships, maybe in having big families, maybe in a successful career. Maybe it is something as simple as that big fast Bond car or another expensive holiday cruise. But if any of those things do give us a buzz, it's fleeting and it never lasts. The holiday ends, the passion fades and it's gone. There just is not enough goodness, lasting goodness in that kind of soil. We are like flowers trying to bloom on a landfill. That's what life is like in this world if we are away from Christ. Our hearts are trying to find satisfaction from cisterns that are empty. It might be though that we are Christians and so we have our roots in the right place, but they are roots that are just too shallow. If we are rooted in Christ, if we are Christians, then actually there is no shortage of goodness there for us to draw from. There is nothing more precious, there is nothing more satisfying in this world than Jesus Christ. He truly is the greatest person in existence. And being found in him is the greatest privilege that we could have. So there is no shortage of nutrients and goodness in Jesus Christ. But the problem is that our roots only go so deep. It might be that we set ourselves in the ground far enough that we can call ourselves saved. But then we don't actually have any interest in digging in and we don't have any interest in living with Christ, not just as our saviour, but as our Lord and doing what he says. And so unsurprisingly, with roots that are so shallow, we end up feeling malnourished in our faith. And when that happens, it's no surprise that we start to look elsewhere for what we think we need for that sense of satisfaction and we start to drift away from Jesus. I mean, Jesus shared an illustration about that once, didn't he? A parable. Seeds that are planted and crops that grow, but then they don't truly root in him with any kind of strength. And while they start off growing, it's not long before the weeds come up and they start to wither away. That is what sin aims to do in our hearts. To stop us rooting in deep so that the devil can come and pluck us up whenever he feels the time is right. But the good news for us all this morning is that in Jesus we do have good soil. And that if we dig down deep, if we set our roots deep, then we can live out a life of gratitude. That life of gratitude, that fruitful life that Paul in the Bible calls on us to have. Jesus, you see, he's not just the aim. He's not just where we want to be, want to follow after on that path before us. But he's also the one that gives us the resources to be able to walk that path in the first place. He feeds us, he nurtures us. And with that renewed strength, he bids us then to follow him. Jesus is, the Bible tells us, the bread of life. He is the one who never leaves us hungry but always satisfied. The psalmist tells us that in his presence we find fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So we can have that sense of gratitude and that sense of contentment and satisfaction in our lives. We can have pleasure forevermore in the life to come if we have faith in him. The amazing thing about all this is that we don't deserve that kind of satisfaction. Jesus should just leave us to drink from the dirty fountains. He should just leave us in our addiction to this slot machine of life where we keep putting our efforts in, we keep putting the pennies in, in the hope that if we pull that one arm bandit enough, finally we might just get something worthwhile back out of our lives. You know, we turned our noses up at Jesus. We do it every day, whether we're Christians or not. We fall into that. We lack gratitude and we seek fulfilment elsewhere. 
And yet still this most precious Jesus loves us. Still God the Father would send his most amazing son to death on the cross for you and for me. So how can we lack gratitude when we dwell on the gospel? Does an addict lack gratitude for the one, for the sponsor who pulls him or her from his poison? How can we sinners lack gratitude for the one who pulls us up from our helpless estate? When we think of Christ in the gospel, there is no lack of satisfaction there. There is no lack of gratitude and there is no way. There is no way that we could ever think of drifting anywhere else or to anyone else. So with that great gospel in mind, let me appeal to you to be rooted in Jesus Christ. If you feel like you have tried rooting down in all the wrong places, then look at verse 7. Be rooted in Christ. This world is never going to give you or I the nutrients that we need. If anything, what it's going to do is it's going to suck the life from us instead and toss us aside like a rag doll whenever we have used up our usefulness. This world, at first, it often tastes sweet, but it's not long until what we thought tasted so good now starts to taste like ash in our mouths. This world, what it offers up, it looks good, but it's wax fruit. There's no taste there, so don't root there. Instead, root yourself on Christ and build your foundation on him. And if you've done that this morning, if you are a Christian, you have set your roots in him, then be established in him. Verse 7, start digging deeper. Don't be satisfied with those shallow roots that we talked about. The soil goes deep in Jesus Christ. There is so much goodness. There is so much sweetness for us to draw out. So don't waste it. You might ask, well, how is it that we do that? How do we set our roots deeper? And the answer is in verse 7, to establish ourselves, it means to grow in knowledge, to grow in knowledge of the faith. As we grow in knowledge of the faith, as we grow in knowledge of Jesus, well, we do that in the same way that we would grow in knowledge and grow in understanding and love of anything else in life. We do it by spending time with other people who are enthusiastic about that thing. In this case, spending time with other believers in our church. By coming to church on a Sunday, every Sunday, and worshipping God and sitting under his word and being encouraged by that and by the other people that we worship with. But you know, one of the big ways I think we miss out on this growth as Christians and in establishing ourselves is that we're just really bad at reading. There are so, so many good Christian books. We've never been so privileged as believers for the amount of things that we can draw good nutrients and good health from. Uh, They are affordable. They're right there on our phones, on our Kindle apps. But whenever we get 15 minutes, you and I, we both do the same thing, whether it's at lunch or on the train, we just sit there scrolling Facebook. I mean, talk about putting your roots down in shallow soil. Talk about drinking from dirty water, spending all your time on social media. And yet we could, we could redeem that time by reading about Jesus, by establishing ourselves in the faith and getting that feeding and being strengthened by those nutrients and digging our roots down deep. Do you know, some people, some Christians think, well, that's not very spiritual, is it? That sounds a little bit mundane, but what I think It is. It's just beautifully simple. You know, anyone can do this. Everyone has a smartphone. From the brightest scholar to, well, you know, me. We can all determine to read something and to spend more time with Jesus. The hard truth is this morning that if we are drifting from Christ... If we think he's mundane, if we think we're malnourished in him, then it's not for a lack in him. It's not for a failing or a lack of substance in Jesus. The failing is in us. 
We are so easily distracted. We are so used to the shallow soil of this world that sometimes we don't know how good a thing we actually have. We don't know what it is to set roots down deep that really matter. But we will never reach the bottom of Christ's goodness. We'll never reach the limits of his love. He is there for us to endlessly plumb those depths and to benefit from them. As we benefit though, it has to lead to action, doesn't it? You know, doctrine has to lead to good behaviour. Orthodoxy has to lead to orthopraxy, is what I keep having to write in my essays when it comes to Paul and Jesus. It means that as we learn, as we better take root in Jesus, then we can better walk with him too as our Lord in verse 6. And yes, we can actually have that elusive life where our hearts are full of fruit and true gratitude in verse 7. It really is as simple as this. As we learn of Jesus, then we will want to walk with him. How could we not? We see the goodness and we see the resources and we see the love that is there for us in Jesus and we simply are compelled. We have to follow after him. You know, so many of us as believers, we feel so burnt out. And I think that is a common problem as we come off the back of this pandemic or what we hope is the back, certainly. But a lot of us burn out because we're constantly running without the fuel. We're running without resources. A lot of the time, as Christians, we think that doctrine is something that muddies the waters, uh, makes things harder. You know, doctrine is mud that we get stuck in, that it stops us living out our Christian life. But actually, that doctrine, that rooting ourselves in Jesus, what it does is that it greases the wheels. It fuels up our engines. It helps us follow our Lord all the better. And it stops us from burning out and feeling like we're running on empty. I mean, just think of it this way. You can't follow Jesus and risk the rejection of your non-Christian friends if you aren't rooted in his acceptance of you. You can't follow Jesus and share his wisdom and his way of life with your family if you aren't drawing first from he who is the wisdom of God personified. You can't walk with Jesus and pick up your cross and suffer for him if you haven't truly grasped the truth of that cross. At the end of the day, we are but little saplings in this life and we can't survive the storms that will come our way if we aren't being rooted deeper and deeper into the good soil of Jesus and his word. But if we are rooted in Christ, then rather than be withered away by this life, what we do is we bear that fruit of the Spirit and we have life that's like a juicy fruit rather than life that increasingly feels like it's turning to ash in the mouth. I'll conclude with the words of a famous hymn. I tried the broken cisterns, ah, but how the waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and mocked me as I wheeled. The pleasures lost I sadly mourned, but never wept for thee, till grace the sightless eyes received, thy loveliness to see. Now none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy Christ Jesus found in thee. So root yourself in Jesus. Establish your faith in Jesus. Jesus. For it is in him and through his gospel that we can walk and live a life of true satisfaction and gratitude.
as we've just sang together, let's go out and do what we've sang. Let's go out there in the week ahead and build our hope, build our lives and find satisfaction in nothing less than Jesus Christ and his gospel. Let's pray together. May the one who makes the crocus burst into bloom, who makes the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy, grant us the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. Amen. <laughs>